Welcome to the location the local news program. I'm Patrick Gallagher. And I'm Melissa Menser, and here's your news now. And these are your top stories in the Locator. As graduation approaches, seniors are making plans for the week between the end of their last semester and graduation. This year, Senior Week will include a trip to Dave & Buster's Atlantic City and a dinner cruise on the Spirit of Philadelphia ship down the Delaware River. All seniors are encouraged to attend and the events will take place on May 11th to the 13th. The Lost Boys of Sudan were given the opportunity to come to the United States after unrest in their home country began. Barbara DeLucia of Soderdam, PA welcomed several of the Lost Boys into her home. She taught them how to cook, clean, and how to educate themselves. This was all made possible through Lutheran Family Services. Now let's check in with location producer Danielle Alio for more on this story. Malyal Dangduo is one of Sudan's lost boys who had to run away from home during the Sudanese Civil War. In 1991, he, with thousands of other boys, walked for three months without food or family. Eventually, his journey left him in Philadelphia, where he has been living ever since he arrived in the country. He shares his story. The life was normal. Walk up and go to eat and play with the kids of your age. Politicians or fighters were fighting somewhere. And people like uh, kids or us at that time did not know what was going on. Until we hear the gunshot, we see military vehicle in the village killing people, crying, noise. Before the war, we were happy. And uh, you see mom and dad every day. After that day, no relatives, no siblings, just separated. Maliwal was nine years old when he heard the gunshots and left Sudan. The journey was dangerous and many boys did not make it. When we ran, we didn't go back home because we saw the, the gunshot from where we came. So we just ran where everybody was running to, hoping that we'll meet parents, families, but we didn't. I saw some people giving up. I can't walk anymore. Sit down. But I said, no. I said, keep going. It's my heart who keep me going. I said, I just keep going. And I see some people who get sick. They got no treatment. People with wounds because they got injured and get swallow as long as you walk, the give up. And when you pass by, you see some piece of body. If somebody left there overnight, hyenas, lion, they could eat them. Many volunteers and organizations in the United States took in the lost boys as their own children. Barbara De Lucia took in two lost boys who had a major impact on her life. These kids were more of a blessing to me. They just opened my eyes to a lot I've never seen or heard about before. They were such good role models for my own grandchildren. It passed all this on to them, too, the idea of being grateful for what you have and appreciating this country and compassion for others. These boys... They are my sons. I mean, there's no denying it. They're my sons. Malyol cast his vote during the Sudanese election for independence in January. The results of the vote will give Southern Sudan independence starting on July 9, 2011. Uh, we hope for Southern Sudan to be a democratic country. We are hoping for peace, a uh, peaceful transition from being a fighting party to become a political party whereby you can provide services to people, road and school, hospitals, things like that. And then there, I hope there should be no more war within southern Sudan. For Location, I'm Danielle Alio. The Center for Teaching and Learning celebrated the semester midpoint on March 8th with Mardi Gras theme festivities. Free snacks were provided to students and faculty who attended. The celebration was meant to be a stress reliever and allow students to take a short break in between classes. The center, which is located in the Idarolda building, offers academic help to students in several subjects. 
And those were your top stories in the Loquitur. For more information, pick up a copy around campus or visit theloquitur.com. Beginning March 22nd, undergraduate studies whose financial obligations to the college were met are eligible to register for classes. Let's go to Jimmy to learn more. Hi everyone, I'm Jimmy Kroll on location. There always comes that time of the semester where students have to wake up extra early to be the first to get to the classes they truly desire. Let's see what students think about course registration. It's been relatively easy and even if I didn't get into a class, I could always email the teacher and they would just put me in it. I had a hold on my records. The hold actually um, kind of made me miss an opportunity to get into a class that I really wanted to get into. So besides that, everything else was just a breeze. Yeah, when it wouldn't let me sign on, my yeah. Cabrini one. Um, I had to go over to the registrar's office and wait in line for like two hours. I don't know. I don't like that some classes are like only available in the spring and not in the fall, or like only in the fall and not in the spring. So that's kind of annoying because then like you have to like wait a whole another semester to like take it when you could just like be finished with it. So that's kind of annoying. Here are the facts about course registration. Students can start registering online at 7 a.m. depending on the number of credits you've earned and the assigned date you're given. Seniors can start registering on March 22nd. Juniors on March 24th, sophomores on March 28th, and freshmen on March 31st. The registrar's office sent out an email on March 10th detailing what students should do before registering for classes this year. Before registering, students should check Cabrini 1 to view any holds on their account, look at the summer and fall 2011 course schedule found online at cabrini.edu slash webtms and meet with their advisor. Reporting for location, I'm Jimmy Kroll. Back to you at the news desk. The 2011 Philadelphia International Flower Show recently closed after being open to the public for a week. Once again, let's check in with Daniel Alio who attended the show. The floral aroma of springtime finally came to Philadelphia or at least to the Philadelphia Convention Center, after a harsh winter with record-breaking temperatures and snowfalls. The 2011 Philadelphia International Flower Show that ran from March 6th to March 13th was based on the theme Springtime in Paris. Florists, gardeners, and landscapers set up showcases of their floral artwork so individuals from all over the world could admire nature's natural beauty. There was a special section dedicated to the theme that gave visitors a look at springtime in Paris without even leaving the country. The Springtime in Paris showcase was centered around a replica of the lower part of the Eiffel Tower that was adorned with lights to give the feeling of an evening walk through the streets of Paris with beautiful flowers lining the path. Towards the back of the showcase was a carousel stage where the animals were made out of a floral design. On the stage, performers gave a small show with Parisian music and dances, including the famous Can Can. The show draws thousands of visitors each year, and the proceeds benefit the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society. For Location, I'm Danielle Alia. And now let's take a look back in history. In 2003, the United States, along with allies from the United Kingdom, began the war in Iraq. Just after explosions began to rock Baghdad, President Bush announced in a televised address, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. In 461 AD, St. Patrick Christian missionary, bishop, and apostle of Ireland died at Sewell Down Patrick, Ireland. Most of what is known about St. Patrick's life comes from his autobiography. Because of his life accomplishments, St. Patrick is the reason Irish Americans began celebrating St. Patrick's Day. Let's find out more about his holiday and the Philadelphia tradition. Hi, I'm Kiara, live for location in downtown Philadelphia at the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Everyone's decked out in green with food, music, and performances today. Let's find out what the big celebration is. And now for some history on the saint that we're here to celebrate. It sort of keeps the Irish together, that's for sure. You know, way back in the fifth century, uh, he was a uh, Roman, actually, a Roman Celt who actually came from an area 
in Wales during the fourth century when the Celts ruled the Irish Sea. They captured him on one of the raids and took him to Northern Ireland where he was held for close to seven years as a slave. Probably the best thing he ever did was he converted, converted Ireland with no martyrs. Nobody was killed. But see, he was smart. There were up to 150 kings in Ireland. So he didn't convert the people. He converted the kings. And then the kings went, boom. It's nice to be king, right? <laughs> and that was your history on St. Patrick's Day. Now back to you at the news desk. And that was your week in history. And now let's check in with Liz Scopoletti for your person of the week. Hi everybody, I'm Liz and today I have Celine Brown, assistant basketball coach with me here today. Thank you for joining us, no Celine. No problem, thanks for having me. Of course. Now you actually went to Cabrini when you were in college. How does yes. it, how, what is it like for you to coach at the um, same college that you went to school at? Uh, it's a great experience to be able to play and coach at the same college. Uh, to, to be able to help the program to when I came in it was a winning they had a winning tradition and to continue that winning tradition at Cabrini College is uh, it's a beautiful it's a beautiful thing uh, you know I was just talking to someone last week how the last time we went to the Sweet 16 in 2001 uh, was the year I was a player here and to go back as a coach you know is, a, is just a great experience and uh, I love it Hope. now what's that transition like from player to coach do you how does it feel to know that you're molding players okay uh, from going to a from a player to a coach it's a it's a very difficult transition because as a player you just show up for practices and you do what the coach tells you to do uh, but as a coach now you have to game plan you know each and every night you have to watch film you have to go out and recruit and you have to make sure all the players are on the same you know same page uh, so it's a, a, a very difficult transition but it was one that I looked up you know I t uh, accepted the challenge of doing so um, as far as going out and finding players and trying to get them to Cabrini College, uh, that's, a, that's another difficult process because they have to like the program, like the coaches. And, um, you know, so we try to do the best that we can as a staff to make people feel comfortable in our program, make the players feel comfortable playing for us because it's more than just, you know, on the court. It's also off the court that we have to be coaches to them too, you know, to help them out in life situations. You know, uh, so it's just not all about basketball. I know a lot of people think that, but, you know, they may have family problems, homework problems, things like that. And, and, uh, and the biggest part for me is being there for them because, you know, someone was there for me when I was a student here. So I want to be there for them, uh, you know, while I'm an adult and, um, you know, someone they can look up to. Now, you had mentioned the recruiting. You go all over and you recruit players. What is that process like? How? Is it more that they're looking at you or you're looking at them? What Are you trying to appeal to them more? It's more you trying to appeal to, to, the, to the students, uh, to the student athletes, uh, because us being Division Three, you know, uh, everybody's so stuck on Division One, Division Two, so it's hard to get players to Division Three. And then also uh, uh, factoring that we don't offer scholarships to these players. So they're coming here and they're taking out loans and uh, grants and things like that. So it is a difficult process, so we have to appeal to them. So. I sell Cabrini College as much as I possibly can that, you know, they're going to come here, uh, get a great education, but also play under a great program. And winning also helps, you know, every player wants to come to a program that's, you know, winning. So this Sweet 16 going this far this year will help us get a lot of recruits. Uh, when I go out and look at a player, I just want somebody who's going to fit the mold of Cabrini College. A, being a good person, uh, being responsible, is going to do well in the classroom, but also well on the, on, on the basketball court. So. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to find that right type of player. Sometimes you, you, you hit big, sometimes you, you, know, you miss. So, but that's the fun part of going out and recruiting and finding someone to come to Cabrini College. Now you mentioned the Sweet 16. That's a huge accomplishment for Cabrini, like you said, mm -hmm. second time since 2001. Yes. What was that like, that whole experience? Are you sad that the season's over? What are your feelings and thoughts on all of that? Uh, it, well, just to start the Sweet 16, I mean, it, it was a great experience just being a part of everything. Uh, some guys were on our team were freshmen, sophomore, juniors, never been to that far before. And, and to get there, now we know what it takes to get back to that point and beyond. You know, so that's our goal already for next year is to, you know, not only get to the Sweet 16, but let's, let's try to make the Final Four. Let's try to win the national championship. So, uh, you know, that's the goal now. And, you know, the season being over, uh, it hurts, but you know now is the time that we, you know, our players and coaches have to focus on the game plan for next year. And you know, winning the final, getting to the final four, winning the national championship, it starts now. You know, it's a it's a it's a long process. So you know, we're in the process of game planning, coming up with different offense and defense ideas. 
uh, out there trying to recruit players to come in and help us out for next year. And also, you know, staying on the returning players to make sure that they're doing everything they have to do to improve themselves, you know, uh, because we're going to be the team that everyone wants to knock off next year and, you know, and then try to beat because we got that far. So. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It was yeah. lovely having you. Well, thanks for having me. Now back to Pat and Alyssa at the news desk. And now let's take a trip around the world. After the earthquake and a tsunami struck Japan, rescuers struggled to get to the survivors on Saturday morning. The 8.9 magnitude earthquake set off a tsunami over coastal cities in the north. According to the Japanese news media, government officials say that the death toll would rise to more than a thousand. People living near two nuclear power plants were issued broad evacuation orders in Japan on Saturday. The power plants, which are operated by Tokyo Electric Power, experienced critical failure of the cooling system after an earthquake. The failure of the cooling system caused pressure to build up beyond capacity of the reactors. The battle for control of Bahrain increased on Tuesday as Iran snapped as Saudi troops were brought in to retake the streets from anti-government protesters. Two men were killed by security forces, the capital of and many surrounding villages look like a war zone with piles of rubble blocking the streets. Now let's check in with your sports news with Holly. Heard there was some heartbreak out in Ohio, Holly. Yes, Pat, there was. This past weekend, the men's basketball team lost to the College of Worcester in the Sweet 16 round of the NCAA tournament, 94-77. to In the game, junior Corey Lemons scored a team-high 20 points, while freshman Fran Rafferty chipped in with 15. This 2010-2011 team is only the second team in the program's history to make it to the Sweet 16. For the second year in a row, third-year head coach Marcus Kahn was named the Philadelphia Area Small College Coaches Association Coach of the Year. In his short time at Cabrini, he has led the team to two Colonial States Athletic Conference Championships and an appearance in the Sweet 16. Congratulations, Coach Kahn. While Cabrini's shot as a Division III title has ended, Let's check in to see what team others thought will win March Madness. Who do you think will win the NCAA March Madness Tournament? I think Ohio State is going to win the NCAA Tournament because they have a good outside shot and they have a good presence down low. <coughs> I think Kansas because they have the best team. It's got to be the Dukies because of the, the leadership of Coach K and the experience from last year. Uh, I think Duke's going to win just because they're returning champions and they have experienced players, especially their seniors. Uh, I think the University of Connecticut's going to win be based uh, upon that they're the hottest team since going to the uh, Big East and they won the Big East tournament. So, I think that Ohio State is going to win March Madness. Number one, they're Ohio State. Number two, my brother goes there. And number three, like, come on, it's Ohio State. You know what I'm saying? Who do you think will win? This is Olivia on location, now back to you at the news desk. In other Cabrini sports news, the women's lacrosse team fell to non-conference opponent Ursinus College 19-3. In the game, sophomore Chrissy Pascarello and freshman Allie Henry and Kelly Manapello all scored one goal for the Lady Cavs. This loss brings their overall record to 0-3. The Lady Cavs are set to take on the College of New Jersey on Thursday at 7.30 in Ewing, New Jersey. That's all the sports news I have for you this week. Be sure to tune into location next week for more sports coverage. Thanks, Holly. And now let's check in with Danielle for your red carpet rants. Hey, guys. Danielle here with your entertainment news. Well, Charlie Sheen revealed who made the cuts for the position of the social media intern, and I'm pretty sure everyone made the cuts, including myself. Will I be applying for the second round? It's debatable. There's so many important things going on in the entertainment world, I couldn't choose just one to talk about. So here's a quick summary. Gilbert Godfrey has been fired for the voice of the Affleck Duck because of his offensive remarks toward the Japan disaster. There will be another Scream sequel. Why? I don't know. Dave Matthews Caravan Festival tickets in Atlantic City go on sale to the public March 25th. Buy them. The situation was booed off stage at the uh, roast of Donald Trump. Shocker. And a music video by artist Rebecca Black has become an overnight sensation, an object of ridicule when she let the world know that, the, that Saturday is the day after Friday and Sunday is the day after Saturday. You don't have to go to Hogwarts to experience magic. Let's check in with Lauren to find out more. Magic, mind reading, illusion, 
All this happened right here at Cabrini College when the campus activities and programming board brought famed mentalist and illusionist Wayne Hoffman to a packed Grace Hall. Among the tricks, Hoffman reverted a crushed can of soda to its original state and read minds to discover phone numbers, pets, past girlfriends, and childhood stuffed animals. These are my people. This is my crowd. These minds that I had at Cabrini were the type of minds that I trained on. So it was fun being here and getting inside of people's heads and, and just feeling the vibe that I, I'm familiar with. <laughs> that was amazing and mind-blowing. I don't know how to get in. It was so oh, crazy. Crazy. Oh, yeah, It was insane. Uh, it was very crazy. He read everyone's minds. He was on point with everything. It was really a good show. Uh, it was awesome. And you come back again. Okay, so if you want to experience the magic and mentalism of Wayne Hoffman, go to waynehoffman.com, click on interact. waynehoffman.com, click interact, and I can read your mind through your computer. Make sure you have a friend or a roommate there because you're going to urinate yourself. I, don't forget, waynehoffman.com, follow me on Twitter, at Wayne Hoffman, all that good stuff. You know the drill. Wayne Hoffman, checking out. Peace. This is Lauren Sleva on location. Well, that's all I have for you this week. I'm off to measure Justin Bieber's mustache hairs. See you next week for more entertainment news. I'm Danielle McLaughlin. Back to the news desk. Thanks, Danielle. And now let's go to Ian with Just a Thought. Hey, it's Ian with Just a Thought. Recently, Starbucks unveiled its new logo. The new logo keeps that creepy looking woman, but gets rid of the word Starbucks coffee. I have a problem with this. As it turns out, Starbucks coffee are the only two words that I actually understand. Please don't get me wrong. I love coffee and Starbucks makes some delicious stuff. But what I don't understand is why it has to be so confusing. I like to compare Starbucks to a Chinese takeout place. It's usually busy, the menu is hard to understand, and you don't often know what's in it, but you order it anyway. My second grade teacher would be flattered to know that I use context clues in this setting. If there's a word that I, us I understand, I usually buy whatever drink that is. It could be dog poop watered down in a blender, but if you put hot on it, I'll never know the difference. Starbucks founders must also be midgets because their tall size is short and stubby. I guess Bilbo, Bilbo Baggins is their marketing director or something. I don't know. What also gets me upset is that everyone else around me seems to speak the language except me. I get to the counter and the person behind it looks, like, looks at me like a long lost puppy looking for a home. While this would be the perfect time to hit on a barista, I often choose to order then hide myself behind my $8 sweater and leave in shame. So next Thursday, meet me back here and we'll do coffee at a gas station. Cool, I'm Ian and that's just a thought. Thanks, Ian. Well, that's all we have time for this week. Be sure to check us out at thelocator.com and subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. I'm Melissa Mensah. And I'm Patrick Gallagher. Enjoy your weekend, Cabrini.